Hi, this is Dark Journalist. Today we're excited to welcome Temple University professor and UFO expert Dr. David Jacobs to the show. Now, Dr. Jacobs has studied the UFO phenomena for over 30 years, and his latest book, Walking Among Us, The Alien Plan to Control Humanity, is his most compelling and controversial yet. Now, Dr. Jacobs' research has led him to conclude that there is an alien-human hybrid program underway that's reaching a new stage of completion. You won't find anything here about benevolent ETs or enlightened visitors coming to save planet Earth. He has one word for the scenario that we're in. Control. Is he right? Here we go, Dr. David Jacobs, Alien DNA and Human Hybrids. This is a secret phenomenon uh, and uh, it's clandestine. And the way in which you make it clandestine is you keep it from the person to whom it's happening. This is bizarre beyond imagination. And yet they all say the same things in the same way with the same experiences around the world. There has never been anything like this in human history. You know, many UFO researchers have considered the ET hypothesis from the standpoint of an advanced culture sent here to look us over and report back on our progress. The UFO question has often been boiled down to the simple notion, well, if they had wanted to, they could have taken over a long time ago. But is that true? What if human concepts of control and destruction are limited when it comes to dealing with an advanced off-world civilization? Is there data to indicate that a program of infiltration by advanced visitors is already underway? And if there is, what is their goal? Let's go ask Dr. David Jacobs. Dark journalist will go there. The deepest issues, the hardest stories, the biggest secrets. The truth is never easy. With top guests, like former Assistant Housing Secretary Catherine Austin Fitz. Catherine, who is really behind this media censorship? And internet feeds go through satellites. Who controls the satellites? It's the Pentagon. Legendary investigator Graham Hancock. Now, Graham, this cataclysm must have destroyed an advanced culture in our ancient past. Uh, it truly was an extinction level event. It was accompanied by massive animal extinctions. It was accompanied by huge and unexplained sea level rises and then a sudden plunge of global temperatures. Best-selling author, Jim Mars. Jim, don't these elite corporate owners need us around to buy their GMO food? Why would they want to depopulate? Because they are eugenicists and they believe that they need to purify the human race. And if that sounds like the Nazis, that's exactly what it is. Coast to Coast AM investigative reporter, Linda Moulton Howe. Linda, how are we going to scale that wall of UFO secrecy? Humans themselves are bypassing, are beginning to dismiss all of the policies of denial and lies. Dark journalists will go there. Visit darkjournalist.com and subscribe now for a special summer discount available for just $39 for one full year. You'll not only receive access to the complete audio archives to stream or download at your convenience, you'll also get exclusive subscriber-only content and Dark Journalist event discounts. Sign up for our free newsletter to stay updated on the latest shows. Dark Journalist. Let's get the real story in 2016. You know, we need dark journalists, so just keep doing what you're doing. Well, hello everyone. We're finally past the crazy season with the political conventions being over finally, but I will say that WikiLeaks certainly made it interesting. Now, interspersed with this media frenzy around the presidential race, there were some very unusual sightings of UFOs happening. Uh, one, a massive fireball apparently streaking through California skies, and note the lack of official explanations on this one. Well, I'm truly pleased we have Dr. David Jacobs here for part one of this deep discussion. So make sure you're signed up for our newsletter at darkjournalist.com to receive updates on all the new episodes so you don't miss anything. David, it's great to have you here with us. I'm a huge fan of your work for many years, and I think your latest book, Walking Among Us, is really your best for dealing with this sometimes shadowy subject matter. It's like Bud Hopkins, my uh, dearest and closest friend for many, many, many years, said. Yeah, he said, I make dark things go down easily. <laughs> well, he definitely had a point there. <laughs> now, what I really find fascinating about the new book is that you're going in-depth 
on these hybrid cases. And as a result of your findings, you've developed some new terms. So let's start off with one of them. What is a hybrid? Well, hybrid is just a combination of human and hybrid. And I, I use the word hybrid to differentiate from all the other hybrids who are not moving in, mm -hmm. essentially. Now, having said that, that's not exactly correct. <laughs> <laughs> because there is some security hybrids will actually move into an apartment so they can be close to uh, the, the abductee who's taking care of a hybrid. Uh, however, security hybrid and security hybrids are not full, are not human. I mean, they're, they're human, but they have a one track mind only. And that is security. That's all they think about. That, that's it period. In other words, their brain f does not function in a normal way that ours does. Whereas with hybrids, they do. They, they, their brain functions normally like ours does, except that they have some abnormal things which enhances their brains, unfortunately. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, you have these interesting categories in the book of these early stage, middle stage, and late stage types of hybrid. So we're really able to see the stages of development now. Right. Well, I, I identified those actually first in, uh, in The Threat, my book, The Threat. I talked about them at, at length. Yes. Well, that one is also an excellent book. Now, what year is that? 2000? It is 2000. So this is, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was 1998. 2000 was an edited book that I did for Kansas University Press. And uh, so it's been 15 years since I published another book. But I had to spend time watching television. I mean, I just couldn't break away from it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that takes about 15 years. Yeah. Well, it's been my experience that when there's a big break like that, it's actually a good thing because then a lot of new information can come up to the surface. And I think with this book, you have a powerful new approach uh, to looking at a number of these issues from a fresh perspective. Actually, that new information began in 2003. Okay. So, uh, but, uh, and by 2007 or eight, I was really ready to publish, but I couldn't get a publisher and I let it lie and this and that. And, uh, so, uh, well, it's so interesting, the arc of your work, you know, you started with these very intriguing abduction cases and regressed them deeply enough to have these breakthroughs with various people who came to you for help. And you really mastered this special type of hypnosis, but you make a compelling point in the book that hypnosis itself is not the only way. And I'll quote from the book here, just to make sure I get it right. Some abductees remember encounters without hypnosis. That is correct. That is correct. Now, I carefully phrased that sentence. All right. Uh, because they will remember hi encounters without hypnosis, but they don't remember everything. Aha. Uh -huh. It's the aliens, if I may use that word, ability to hide this phenomenon in people's minds is excellent. Yes, there will be some people who have bleed through memories. Most people don't even have that. Mm -hmm. All I know is that they lead weird lives, but they've led weird lives since they were children. So that's what everybody must lead. That's normal for them. Yeah. It never occurs to them that they're being abducted almost on a daily basis sometimes. And uh, however, the ones that, that come forward, who are the ones that we see, uh, do have bleed through memories. They know something is wrong, they, that their, their friends don't have these experiences that they do. And they might remember some encounters. They might remember somebody being in the bedroom. They might be, remember somebody, uh, they might be remember being on board a UFO. And that's all, and they'll remember things like that. And so that's what we can focus on then. Uh, now, can you tell me a little bit about the hypnotic induction technique that you use? It's just simple words. Say, relax, 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 relax. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll bring a friend who's sitting in a chair near me. They're hearing the same words. It means nothing to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to want to go into the state. Right, you have to want to, and it's just simple relaxation. If you can get the person relaxed, you start asking questions. They're not going to, you, you can't think, make them think that they're a chicken and they're going to jump around and flop around or something like that, or that uh, they're a teacup or what, whatever <laughs> it is, you know, they're, they're not, you can't do that. They're, they're awake. They're thinking to themselves, 
That's the stupidest question I ever heard. I'm not going to answer that question. In other words, they're in control. Right. They're, they're not paying, they're, they're paying attention to my questions, but sometimes they will just, it's, it's too, the question might be too embarrassing for them, so they'll just skip it. Mm-hmm. In other words, they're in reality. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's most people think that I'm that that they're uh, very weak and they're vulnerable and I can instill memories in them and they won't know the difference. That is not the the case. That is not the case. Uh, they're they're totally uh, in control. Right. And in these early days of doing this, were these encounters surprising to you? You know, when you discovered that people were experiencing contact with aliens. No, because uh, I had met Bud Hopkins in 1982, and Hopkins, uh, I sat in on a bunch of his sessions. I was not much interested in the abduction phenomenon until I met him, and uh, he showed me how what he, he, he had been taking his people to a psychologist, uh, Aphrodite Claymar, who wrote the uh, introduction to his first book, Missing Time, and uh he would uh, give her artwork in lieu of payment because, you know, he... Well, he was an artist. He was an artist, and he was a starving artist, in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, but then he realized how simple it was to do. So he just started doing it himself, and it worked just fine. Mm-hmm. And then I, I sat in on a, a bunch of sessions that he did, several sessions that he did, and I wrote down every word he was saying, you know, and be making, and uh, uh, that's that's how I started. So it's uh, it's just it's so simple to do. It's it's kind of ridiculous, actually. It works, however, it does work, and people do begin to remember. Having said that. And this is a huge, huge, huge red flag that corrupts the abduction world. <laughs> if I may use all those words together. Um, people tend to say things that are not true, even though they are not lying and they think they are correct. Uh-huh. It's called confabulation. Confabulation takes place going back to this original sentence that you read from my book, confabulation takes place most, by far most, in consciously remembered uh, accounts. They were abducted, they're remembering pieces of it, but a lot of what they say is wrong, or, or they've skipped huge parts, or they've turned things around in a different way, or just plain didn't happen. Mm-hmm. That's confabulation. Uh, it's when you do hypnosis, the first session is the most amount of confabulation in terms of hypnosis. Uh, they're remembering more, but they'll still confabulate. They oftentimes will drop themselves into a different event that happened to them. When they say, I'm looking down at my at my dress, they'll say, and I I haven't had this dress since I was ten years old. I think I'm a I think this is a different event. I think this is a different a different situation, you know. So you're bringing them back too far. No, no, they're doing it themselves. Ah, I'm just asking what happens next. I see. And so uh, um, then they'll tell me, I think I've, I, I've skipped into another one. That happens in the first session of, uh, most of the time. Not most of the time, but when it's, it's going to happen, that's when it happens. Uh, this, and, but they'll say things, they'll skip things, they'll, they'll say things that are not true, and all sorts of things. So I always say that the first session is a throwaway session. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second session, it's a little better. They're a little bit more aware of it. Uh, they still will will say things that are not correct and that sort of stuff. Third session, they're much better at it, and uh, they're more careful. Fourth session, no problem. Right. And uh, uh, there's no confabulation, and they're very careful. And the reason is is because my questioning is logical and chronological. Being chronological is extremely different for uh, difficult for a lot of people who do this kind of work for reasons that I do not understand. Interesting. Well, I want to get into that. Uh, one quick thing here. I want you to address what the debunkers are saying now. And the new official story from the psychology crowd seems to be 
uh, you know, and we know they get very nervous outside of their comfort zone of accepted reality. But their position now is that there is no alien abduction phenomena. It's all just sleep paralysis. Now, how do you respond to that? It's not sleep paralysis. Let me just get that. All right. uh, let me just tell you a little fact. The majority of cases that I've looked at have not happened when a person is sleeping. Therefore, it cannot be sleep paralysis. That is the end of the argument. <laughs> a lot of people still go on with sleep paralysis debunkers mainly who who have no idea what they're talking about uh you know and they have no knowledge of the abduction phenomenon they just say it can't be happening therefore it isn't it must be sleep paralysis or sexual abuse in childhood or 37 or 38 other things that i've got listed of what they've said so they're just looking for an easy explanation and not going any further. yeah it's 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 profound stupidity yeah, is what it is. It's just they 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 think that it is so ridiculous that this is happening. They do not bother to engage themselves with the evidence or the data. There's no reason to. It's a waste of time. It can't be happening. And you, I, debunkers do this all the time. Yeah. Without that ability to be stupid, there wouldn't be any debunking. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, so when people are being regressed and you're having them think in these chronological terms, that's when things start to open up. The, the fact is, though, that that uh, chronologically, basically what you're doing is you're saying, OK, there's somebody in your room. You, you're, you're asleep. Why do you wake up? They say, oh, I wake up and there's I think there's there, there's a like, why do you wake up? I, I don't know. Well, that's a good question. You can only ask questions about what they say. I say, I think there's somebody in my room. I say, okay. I say, where is this person? Uh, he's out the, the uh, um, foot of my bed. Okay. Uh, what happens next? Uh, I think there's another person too. Well, where is the other person? Oh, he's near me. Okay. Then what happens? Well, there's a light coming into the window. Well, when you say a light, do you mean an incandescent light bulb type light? You know, yellowish, uh, soft light? No, 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 no. See, you're, you're asking now a leading question that is a wrong question. Right. You have to start doing that, especially in the first couple of sessions, to see whether they're going to say yes, because they should be saying no. They all say no, no. It's a bluish light. It's coming straight in. Well, is it lighting up your whole room? No, it's just sort of coming in like a, a tunnel or something, you know. That's chronological. Okay. Now, there is a classic scenario that you've come across over and over again related to the alien abduction phenomena. And it's usually that there's a man driving home with his family, and he sees a light in the sky. So he goes to pull over and look at it, and then suddenly the light takes off. Right. And they're left there by the side of the road uh, looking up, essentially. <laughs> You know that 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 bothered me for years. I, I I kept thinking, why do these people always tell me the same exact story when they see a UFO? Nobody, it seems, it's that's close by and it's off to the side of the road. Nobody, it seems, just drives by and and just keeps looking and keeps on going. They all pull over to the side of the road to get a better look. <laughs> And it just, it, it, it seems to me that there had to be some people who didn't pull over to the side of the road to get a better look. <laughs> right. So I finally began to examine those. And uh, and the, sure enough, there was more things happening. Obviously, it was an abduction event. Mm -hmm. uh, but they completely forgot the event and they just put the tooth, the two elements together of them stopping and then the UFO flying off at fantastic speed. And then they continued on as if it was all one smooth kind of event that happened. Uh, but this is a secret phenomenon, uh, and uh, it's clandestine. And the way in which you make it clandestine is you keep it from the person to whom it's happening. Uh, and, um, and it's exceptionally uh, successful. I would say that 95% of abductees do not know that they're abductees. That's a guess. Maybe it's only 85%, you know, or maybe it's 99% for all I know. But um, uh, but most people do not know that they're abductees. Most people know that uh, uh, something strange has been happening to them, but they can't connect it to the abduction phenomenon. 
Well, how many people do you think actually work up the courage to go and see someone qualified like you to uncover these memories? The amount of mail I get is ridiculous. <laughs> people, they, 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 they want to have sessions with me or they live in Saskatchewan or they live in Poland or whatever it is. And they want to know if there's anybody uh, around that they can go to. This happens. I got an email like this this morning. This happens all the time, all the time. Uh, it's and and the problem is the problem is that there's me and I'm already old and ancient both at the same time <laughs> and um, and then there's uh, Kathy Martin in Florida and there's Jed Turnbull in New York City and there's Yvonne Smith in L.A. and there's a guy in Minneapolis uh, whose name escapes me with it right now so that's like five. So it's just a handful of qualified people who can do There's this. Literally a handful of qualified people. Literally a handful. All the rest who do this kind of work are um, uh, a, 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 a trained therapists in some way. Uh, they're therapists who've gone through therapy training uh, um, and gone through hypnosis and all that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, mostly who don't have PhDs or, or, or MDs or anything like that, but they have a, you know, they're, they're, they're extremely important people and they have uh, a good practice. The problem is they can only spend a limited amount of time with each abductee, an hour, I don't know. I was able, because I was a university professor, I was either on a Tuesday, Thursday, or a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule of teaching. Oftentimes they had to come in other days too for various committee work and all that sort of stuff. Because of that, however, I had a lot more time than people normally have who have a full-time job. So I could afford to spend between four and five hours with each abductee every session. An hour talking with them beforehand, usually me talking at them, uh, and then uh, a couple of hours of hypnosis, and then an hour talking about what happened uh, afterwards. That is was a luxury. Now, people come to me I usually don't accept people who are just interested in what happened, where they're curious. I, I tend to accept people who are desperate, who, who want to get to the bottom of this, who don't know what's happening, that's interfering with their lives. They can't sleep at night, they wake up all night long with a gun in their head, in their hand, you know, thinking they're coming in, they're coming in, I'm going to get them, you know. And um, their lives are warped in some way because of this. And my job is to get them back on an even keel, is to get them to lead a normal life, the one life they're gonna have. And uh, even though it's, the abduction phenomenon is still going to happen, it doesn't matter. They're still gonna be abducted. After a while, they do with enough sessions with me, they don't care anymore. Hmm. They just wanna get on with their lives. And then I know I have won a victory when they stop coming that, that they just don't wanna. Having said that, I'm, I'll, I, there's a woman I'm still working with every once in a while who I've been working with since 1987. Now, wow. is this Betsy? No, it's Karen Morgan. Oh, yes, yes. Who made all three books. Uh-huh, <laughs> right, right. And her case is very curious because there's such a tug of war between them telling her what to do, and she's very independent-minded. So there's a lot of conflict there. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about her? Um. Karen Morgan is the one they took to the uh, uh, 7-Eleven or Wawa, as they call them out here. And they wanted to, the guy wanted to teach her to teach him how to buy a, buy something. Yes. And she yes. refused to do it, basically. Right, right. And when, when, the, when the guy behind the counter handed him his change, he had no idea what this was or what he should do. And then he just grabbed her and ran out, leaving the guy behind the counter holding the change that deserved. <laughs> yeah, she's very unique. That's Karen Morgan. She's uh, always a, a one who's always says no, 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 no. But she always does what they want her to do anyway. You know? But she seems to possess a feisty quality that doesn't allow them total control, right? She, her brain chemistry is such that she can do that. Most people can't even approach that. Some other ones can a little bit and more so. It, it, there's a, there's a, a spectrum. But the vast majority of people just do what they're told to do. They have no control over themselves. Yeah. Right. Now, in Betsy's case, she actually had over 100 abduction experiences. 
Yes. Uh, this is not unusual. In fact, it's usual. Okay. Here's how you look at that. Supposing a guy is four, is four years old when he remembers his first abduction event. The abduction events have taken place before the age of four, but let's just say that's when he first remembers one. And he comes in and he's 44 years old. And he's written down a list of all the odd things that have ever happened to him. He's one of these people who can know, who knows and knows something is wrong. This is an actual case. This is an actual guy. So you're dealing with uh, 40 years of, of events. Now let's just say his events were uh, five times a year. That is not possible. I mean, it's possible, but I've never, I have never had anybody only had five events a year. Uh -huh. Never. Having said that, that's wrong because sometimes people come to me only once. So I can't really tell. <laughs> but for people who've worked with me for a period of time, there's always 10 trillion events. So um, that's if a guy only has five events a year, and most abductees would give their right arm to have only five a year, that's 200 right there. So it adds up, you know what I mean? Over the because yeah. it, it goes from childhood into old age, so it adds up. So seeing somebody, hey, this guy had a list of two hundred different things that he brought to me. It's it's not unusual for people to have five hundred, seven hundred, nine hundred. God, God knows how many. We 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 can't tell. We don't really know unless you investigate every one. So if I investigated in Betsy's case a hundred different experiences that she had, it means nothing. It's just normal. Right. The whole phenomenon is is bizarre from top to bottom. There isn't anything that isn't strange about it, unless you get into it to the degree I have, where nothing is strange. It's all normal, you know. <laughs> well, you're so used to it. Now, these ongoing patterns fascinate me because you also have this intergenerational aspect in these abductions. Right. What is that all about? It, it's it's intergenerational. That is to say, if an abductee who does not know that he or she is an abductee, gets married uh, to a non-abductee, and we have to assume that the majority of Americans or people are not abductees, um, uh, and they have three kids, all the three kids will be abductees. And when those three kids get married to non-abductees, and they, and they each have three kids, and now suddenly we're into higher math that I can't figure out, but all their children will be abductees also. Uh, and um, there's a reason for this. Okay. There are three pillars to the abduction phenomenon. Number one, it is intergenerational. Mm -hmm. And we've known this since forever, since, since, since Bud Hopkins first started doing research into this and he realized that it's, inter, it's intergenerational. Uh, I'm more, I was more um, wedded to that than he was uh, in the beginning. Uh, but um, but it's, it, it, everybody I've ever talked to uh, uh, at any length about this phenomenon knows that they were abducted with their sister or their brother, for example. Right. And they know that something that their mother once saw an angel or their mother once saw a dead person who came back to say goodbye as a family story. That doesn't happen with abductees. They think it's a dead person who's come back, and then when we look at it in hypnosis or whatever, they realize this is not a dead person. This is somebody oh, else altogether. I see. Um, and um, so it's intergenerational, and that holds true, uh, as far as I can tell, very, very strongly. It is global. This is not an American phenomenon. This takes place around the world. Uh, and Everybody around the world basically says the same thing. They basically have the same experiences. Uh, and the experiences are unlike anything anybody has ever said in history. Uh, uh, saying that you're being abducted by aliens from another planet is new. People didn't say this in the 12th century. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They, they, they didn't say it in the 19th century either. Yes. And, they, and so uh, it's new in the cosmic time, you know. And by saying it's global and everybody says the same thing with the same details and has the same experiences, I am describing, I am saying something everybody's listening to that can't be possible. 
This is the first time this has ever happened in human history. Nobody has ever said the same extraordinary things. Obviously, there are certain things that all humans have in common that they all are going to do, you know, but uh, you can just imagine. But, um, but this is not imaginable. This is bizarre beyond imagination. And yet they all say the same things in the same way with the same experiences around the world. There has never been anything like this in human history. That is an accurate statement. Wow. Well, that is a powerful realization. And when we come back, we'll get into the implications of this alien-human hybrid program and why it's essential to covert forces that the secrecy around it be maintained in perpetuity at any cost. Last round here of part one with David Jacobs. The doctor's in the house. Stay with us. Go deeper with Dark Journalist. Subscribe now and you'll have access to the complete audio archives to download or stream at your convenience. Receive advanced updates and discounts on Dark Journalist events. Enjoy exclusive subscriber-only content. Go deeper with Dark Journalist. Visit darkjournalist.com and subscribe now for a special summer discount. Available for just $39 for one full year. Dark Journalist. The truth is never easy. sitting there filming a little saucer came from uh, I say little saucer it was a saucer came flying over their heads put down three little landing gear and landed right out on the dry lake bed and they picked up their cameras and started over toward it filming as they went and when they got in fairly close to it it lifted up put the gear back in the wheel wells tipped up and took off at a great rate of speed Dark journalist will go there. Is there data to indicate that a program of infiltration by advanced visitors is already underway? Hidden technology. So in other words, the possibility exists that you have here a machine that is manipulating magnetic fields on a planetary scale that has nothing to do with particle physics. The black budget. But there's no such thing as getting away from the corruption because it, it is literally it is now integrated into every economy in the globe. Geoengineering. I'm talking about right down to the DNA level. Imagine that you have now put microprocessors and sensors along with everything else into every human body. For more deep interviews, special reports, and documentaries, visit darkjournalist.com today. Dark Journalist, the truth is never easy. And we are back. This is Dark Journalist, and I'm speaking with Dr. David Jacobs, professor at Temple University in Philadelphia and the author of Walking Among Us, which I feel is his best book, really. He has many others, including The Threat, but this one has a lot of new research and cases, and we're going to go even deeper into it. Now, David, uh, when we left off, we were going through the three pillars of the abduction experience You went through the first two, so what is the third one all about? The third thing is, um, it is uh, clandestine. It's secret. In one of my books, I can't remember the secret life or or the threat, I think it's the threat, I have a chapter on secrecy, on why this phenomenon is secret. It's a preserve uh, for women who get pregnant, uh, who with induced pregnancies, uh, pre- preserve the fetus. Uh, there's that reason. There's all sorts of other reasons why it's secret. But in writing my latest book uh, called Walking Among Us, uh, I uh, boil it down to one sentence. They don't want us to know what they're doing. Yeah. That is an irrefutable argument. They don't want, if they wanted us to know what they were doing, uh, they would have been telling us. <laughs> they, they, they wouldn't be secret, obviously. It's irrefutable. Uh, now they can say, well, they don't want us to cause disruption in uh, in, a, in the society through what, what we used to call years ago when you met a uh, a tribe uh, called ethical non-interference. Oh yeah, you don't meet a tribe out in the jungle that, that uh, they've, they've never seen a, a a non-tribal person. Let's just say and say, well, here, here's a gift. Here's a gun. 
Exactly. It will destroy the tribal society. Yeah. And so you can't do that. And they learned, uh, anthropologists learned that the hard way. And um, so, uh, uh, but that's not what it is. It's they don't want us to know what they're doing. They do not want us to know that they're coming and they're getting people in the middle of the night or in the middle of the day or while they're driving or whatever it is. And, uh, um, and, and taking them and, and doing this and that and this and that and all sorts of other things. They don't want anybody to know that around the world. Well, this is a crucial point. Of course, we tend to focus on the government side of the secrecy around the UFO topic, but it is the visitors themselves who keep the tightest secrecy, because just as this breakaway deep state culture is obsessed with secrecy, the visitors themselves don't want this getting out at all, as evidenced by their mind control program to have the abductee forget the experience. That is correct. That is correct. Um, Calling them visitors is a whole other world. <laughs> well, you can tell me what's best. It used to be, back in the old days, uh, you could not say the word alien at all. You had to say, when they talked about who was inside UFOs, uh, they had to say the word occupants. Ah, uh, yes. Because uh, and I've got a book behind me called UFO Occupants. <laughs> oh, that's classic. Uh, and later on, the bolder ones would say humanoids. Uh, but they still couldn't use, uh, not, not until the late 60s could you use the word, uh, or even early 70s could you use the word alien. Uh, even now, it sticks in the craw. Yeah, definitely. But alien is the most appropriate term, you'd say. Yeah, they, these, are, these are truly aliens. These, these, these people come from another place in the universe. I, I can't even say planet because we do not have evidence for that. Uh huh. But they come from somewhere else in the universe. Uh, or the galaxy. Well, that's the same thing. It's somewhere else in the universe. And so, um, uh, uh, but we don't know the, the interesting thing about these beings, these aliens, is we don't know their backstory. We don't know where they're from. We don't know um, uh, whether there's a higher ups who are, who are uh, they're answering to, who are dictating the, 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 uh, the program in some way. Uh, we don't know uh, we don't know hybrids, if I may use that word, wear a certain kind of clothes on board the UFO. I call it hybrid garb. Uh -huh. they, most of them who are not going to be moving into apartments here, most of them wear uh, sort of a beige colored uh, outfit. Uh, women wear a three quarter length or half sleeve length. Uh, uh, or three-quarter sleeve length uh, shift, essentially. And um, uh, the males uh, wear a um, uh, pants and a shirt, all about the same color. But we don't know who makes those or where they get them from. Well, there's no backstory. In other words, all, all that stuff is not, not amenable for abductees to see. Well, what about their regular habits or their diet? You know, are they adjusting to the kind of food that's available on Earth? We do know that how gray aliens get their nutrients through skin absorption. Early stage hybrids, I'm jumping the gun here, get their nutrients through skin absorption. Okay. Uh, later stage hybrids who look more human and act more human and are more human eat through their mouths. Okay. So they've made the adjustment. Right. We don't know who makes the nutrients or who makes the food, or where, they're, where they get their supplies. In other words, we don't know anything about the backstory, uh, which you'd think, you know, which stands to reason, because abductees are just not told that. That's just not abductee stuff. That's backstory stuff. So we can only guess at that. Uh, but there is a backstory. There is a backstage. There are areas where, where um, abductees are not taken in large UFOs, not in a small UFO, obviously, but in large UFOs. There's, there's got to be a huge sort of industrial-sized component to this entire phenomenon, this global phenomenon, that supports it in some way, physically right. or whatever. A hidden infrastructure. There's got to be some sort of infrastructure that we do not know about, and uh, uh, I don't know if we're ever going to learn about that. I, 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 it's never been opened up to me, you know. And even in a five-day event that I examined once, which I have not really written about, uh, a woman, her husband, and child were uh, gone for five days. 
they had just moved to a new state, did not have jobs or friends. Nobody knew that they were gone. <laughs> it was a perfect timing. And they, she uh, actually wandered off somewhere in an accidental situation and walked into a place where, and I think I wrote this part up, where uh, hybrids were in um, coffin-like boxes that were immersed in liquid. And uh, they, in a room that had a, maybe a 20 of them in there, and they were reclining. And then suddenly these coffin-like things all sort of stood up on end the water or the, 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 the liquid floated, came down, and then the doors opened and they all walked out. And she said to one of them, to this guy who was supposed to be uh, taking care of her, um, an a, a, a gray alien, what are you doing? And he said, eating and sleeping. Huh. Eating, yes, because we have other evidence of this skin absorption. Sleeping, I'm not so sure about. Not so sure that that was correct, that she said. Uh, because uh, to the best of our knowledge, we have never heard of them sleeping again, and therefore this is an outlier, and you have to think maybe confabulation, maybe she thought, and whatever, uh, but there's not enough evidence to prove that, to show that they're sleeping. Is there evidence to suggest that they don't sleep? Yes. Wow. Uh, and that's just through the, the enormous amount of them at all hours of the day and night, Day in, day out. This That's a big advantage. That's a pretty major advantage for them. It is a huge advantage. The question is, do hybrids sleep? The answer is basically no. Uh-huh. <laughs> Even the human ones, they might go into a rest state of a few hours, a vestige of sleep, but the evidence that they're actually asleep is just not there. Huh, fascinating. Now, in terms of a hybrid's appearance, is a hybrid going to be kind of average, or will they be beautiful? Are they different races? You know, is there something supernatural in their countenance or their appearance? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> they go for the average. If a hybrid is going to move in to an apartment in uh, with us, uh, they can't look strange. They can't have a giant nose or no nose. They can't be seven feet tall or three feet tall. <laughs> they, they, they've got to look average, 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 average. Uh, they cannot stand out in a crowd. The only difference between them and us is that they can control us uh, mentally, and we cannot control them. Just like abductees are in control by these aliens and hybrids on board a UFO, that is the major difference between them and us if they're living here. That's a fairly important difference, I would say. If they can control us, they can make us see through our mind's eye anything that they want us to see. They can make us do anything that they want us to do. That makes us second-class citizens and them first-class citizens. Right. For some reason or another, I don't like that. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I want to be a first-class citizen and make them second-class citizens. That would be good. But that's not not what is happening. And uh, uh, consequently, if a person sees somebody somewhere and, and he's acting weird, uh, a colleague who's working or whatever is acting weird, and uh, they, they think, they'll think, you know, I know a guy who's a hybrid. And the answer is, I don't think so. Most, 99% of the time, that's just a weird guy. <laughs> Plenty of humans are weird. Trust. And when they go for the average, as usual, uh, in terms of the way they look, uh, they're average, five foot nine, let's just say. Or five foot nine and a half, which is what the average in the United States, I believe, something like that. Uh, they're not going to be six feet tall. They're not going to stand out in the crowd. They're just going to look like anybody else. And anybody who does stand out in any way is culled from the herd, so to speak, before they come down here. They're, yeah. they're, they're taken out. Uh, and so uh, this is an exceptionally intelligence program. And the question is, it's so well done. Has this ever been done before? Are we the first planet 
ever to undergo what I just call hybridization. And um, uh, I, I address this in the book. We don't know and, we, and, and, and nobody talks really. There's, there's a little bit of evidence that we aren't, but I didn't include it. It's just not enough. Um, but through simple logic, there's plenty. These, these beings know what they're doing. They're going about their activities in a routine fashion. Uh, this does not seem unusual to them. They're, nothing surprises them. Nothing amazes them. Now, it could be it's because they've been doing it for so long. You know, we, we have cases dating back to, that we've looked at, investigated, dating back to the 1920s. Um, but I don't think so. I think that this is a normal phenomenon uh, that happens in, in, in the universe. That includes, obviously, our galaxy. Uh, and uh, you have to understand that our technology is brand new. Let's say it's 200 years. That's still with, well within the brand new realm. Right. <laughs> if you say it's 5,000 years old, okay, it's almost brand new. If, if another... If there's another advanced technology out there, another group that has technology at all, and it's just slightly advanced in terms of cosmic time, it could be 50,000 years in advance of ours. Right. That's not, that would not be unusual because our technology is brand new. The Hubble telescope and the Kepler uh, telescope have found now about 3,000 planets. Astronomers are now, astronomers are now saying that uh, there's probably more planets than there are stars. And we know that there are hundreds and hundreds of stars out there in the universe. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, close enough. Close enough. <laughs> But you make an excellent point here, which is that the odds of an advanced civilization coming here and taking stock and assessing our culture is actually quite high when you think about it. It's pretty close to 100%. Uh, the, uh, the, the odds that there are advanced technological uh, uh, um, civilizations out there has got to be 100%. Because we are an advanced technological so uh, uh, society and we are out there. Mm -hmm. It can't just be us alone. That's just not feasible. It's just, it's crazy to think that. Right. We've already found planets in the Goldilocks zone, you know, and all the rest of this stuff. And pretty soon we're going to take real close looks and see people waving at us. Yeah. It's going to happen. I totally agree. And because of the excessive secrecy, this culture is nowhere near prepared for this kind of event. Right. David, amazing stuff. Thank you. And we'll end this part one episode here. Uh, remember, subscribers will get part two in their inbox next week, and it's a great time to subscribe at darkjournalist.com. While that summer discount is still going, Dr. Jacobs' latest book is Walking Among Us, The Alien Plan to Control Humanity. Really striking. Uh, David, thank you again for an amazing part one episode. In part two, we're going to go deep on how you discovered personally that uh, some of these hybrids and hubrids became aware of you and that became a very sticky and dangerous situation. Fascinating stuff coming up in part two. So David, thank you for sticking around and we'll get into part two right now. Well, thank you kindly, I appreciate it. Thank you for joining me for this fascinating episode on alien DNA and human hybrids with Dr. David Jacobs. You can find more special reports, in-depth interviews, and documentaries at www.darkjournalist.com. You can also subscribe here to our YouTube channel to receive the latest videos. See you soon. Subscribe to our newsletter at darkjournalist.com to stay updated on the latest shows.